Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Dr. Gabriel Herskew. Dr. Gabriel Herskew is a vascular and endovascular surgeon specializing in minimally invasive treatment of arterial and venous disease. He specializes in office-based treatments for varicose veins and other chronic vein disease. Dr. Herskew attended medical school at the University of California, Irvine School of Medicine. He obtained his general surgery training at the UC Irvine Medical Center and then a two-year vascular and endovascular surgery fellowship at the University of Southern California Medical Center in Los Angeles. He has dedicated training in vascular ultrasound and is the medical director of the vascular laboratory. Well, hello. Uh, it's nice to meet all of you and uh, it's my pleasure to tell you today about um, some of the advances made in venous care. Um, the presentation I have for you today has a fair amount of anatomy and physiology in it at the beginning so you understand the, the basic framework and then it's, and then it's sort of a uh, uh, dog and pony show after that. So I'll show you some neat techniques that we're doing, some things that have really changed the whole face of venous surgery. And um, I'll show you a little bit of perspective uh, based on some historical accounts as well to make, keep it interesting. So let's start at the beginning. What are veins? So veins, uh, the circulatory system of the human body, uh, we can, if we start at the heart, which is the pump, uh, the blood is, the oxygenated blood is pumped through arteries, as you can see on the left, that go down to all the tissues of your body. It then goes across capillaries and it comes back to your heart within the veins. And so the veins, of these structures on the right, screen, right of the screen are what I'm focusing on today. Uh, these veins are very different from the arteries and they have a different function entirely. They bring the blood back to the heart. Uh, of devoid of oxygen to uh, be reoxygenated in the lungs. So they differ in, in the capacitance. The veins are able to uh, uh, hold a larger volume of blood. In fact, 60 to 80 percent of the volume of blood in your body is within the veins at a given time. And the pressure of the blood within the veins is much less than that in the arteries, except for in certain circumstances a few of which I will talk about. So the anatomy of the veins is different. If you, in a cross-sectional view of an artery compared to a vein, you can see that the artery on the left has a much thicker wall. And that accounts for the changes, the difference in capacitance or the ability to uh, hold a larger volume of blood. This area called the tunica media is the muscular layer of the, of the uh, vessel and that's uh, much thinner in the veins and so even at, at surgery when we operate on these they're very thin walled and fragile as compared to arteries which are more robust. So the goal of the, of the venous function is to return blood to the heart um, and it, there's actually a quite complex system that, that uh, accomplishes that. And so I'll, I'll spend a little time explaining this because this is the key to understanding the pathology or the, the disease processes that affect the veins. Um, so you have to understand a little bit of the anatomy of where it comes from and a little bit of the function before we can talk about those things. So this, this is a diagram of the veins on their way back up to the heart. 
uh, you can see that, they, that the veins from your legs join in the abdomen uh, and form the vena cava, uh, which, is right, which is the common vein where it says inferior vena cava. So they join together and then they go up to the heart. They're returned to the heart where they're pumped to the lungs. The blood is pumped to the lungs for reoxygenation. So the human body uses a series of valves and a complex hemodynamic system, its own pump actually, uh, for the veins. And I'm, I'll show you those, uh, how this works. In the lower extremities, the arteries are pictured on the right and the veins on the left. And for the most part, the veins uh, parallel the arteries. They, they, the arteries bring the blood down, the veins are going up, and it's, it's like a two-way street in your legs. But there are superficial veins, uh, the most important of which is the great saphenous vein that, uh, that bring the blood uh, through a separate system that's closer to the skin. Uh, and there, there are many of these superficial veins in the leg. Uh, only a few of them are named in comparison with the total number. Uh, but they become very important in certain types of disease. So now for some physics. So if you have blood that needs to come all the way back up to the heart, how much pressure is there at the level of the ankle? Well, if we do a calculation, uh, the, the pressure at the bottom of a column of fluid is calculated by multiplying the density, which is that rho character, times the force of gravity times the height of the column. And so it's proportional to the height of the column, the amount of pressure. And so if we look at a human body, let's say it's 150 centimeters or five feet approximately, that height will produce, based on the density of blood, 117 millimeters of mercury at the ankle, that height of that column of blood. So that would mean that the, your body would have to move blood against that force, against that pressure, to get the blood back to your heart. So how does it overcome that? This is not the actual pressure that's found in the arteries, sorry, in the veins. Uh, it's actually much lower, and we'll, I'll show you the system it uses. This is another, another diagram showing the difference between the arteries and the veins. And the arteries, and this is a little bit harder to understand, but um, basically the, the 117 millimeters of mercury pressure is, the, is, if you just count a column of blood, is what you result, uh, have it as a result at the level of the ankle. So here's the, the secret. This is the, the uh, design of the human body that's, that's really amazing. Uh, there are valves within the veins. And these are very fragile, thin-walled valves that uh, are one-way valves. So the blood can go up through them and they open up. And then as the blood sits back down, they rest back together and, and restrict the flow back down to uh, back upstream, I suppose you could say. And so these valves are placed at intervals throughout the veins of your lower extremities. Now, if you look at, at nature and, and other animals, uh, you know, other animals don't walk upright. You know, human beings walk upright. And so we have these valves within the legs that become very important. And so when we, if we apply that back to our uh, physics lesson, you're dividing your, your column, which is of height h, into multiple pieces. So if there are three valves, now we've divided into four different segments. And so now the height of the column is actually H divided by four. You don't have that full column of blood. So when the blood rests down on these valves, it's only exerting a pressure for that segment between the that one and the next valve, the next competent valve. So back to anatomy a little bit. Uh, the deep system of, of veins are the veins in, in your legs that are within muscle. Okay, so these are, they have muscle or, or muscular fascia surrounding them. Uh, these communicate directly with the, the big veins, what we call the central veins in the abdomen and, and chest. Uh, so there, it's a direct connection, and it does have valves like I described throughout. It's all the way down. There's less up top, more down low. Um, this is where deep venous thromboses happen, if you've heard of DVT happens in these deep veins. And there's, there are quite a few sequelae of uh, DVT formation that I'm going to show you. Uh, but this is the, the system we're talking about. And when we look at the veins, the, uh, the main ones that we deal with are the iliacs. So the iliac veins are at the top, the femoral, popliteal, 
and then the smaller tibial veins, we call them, at the, uh, in the, at the level of the calf. The superficial system, when we're talking about superficial, we're talking about the saphenous uh, system, the great saphenous vein and the small saphenous vein. And so those are the two main superficial veins. Uh, and there are branches of those that are, are well studied and well recognized, but the two main ones we deal with and the ones to remember are the great saphenous and small saphenous. And then in between those, there are perforators. And these are any vein that goes from the deep compartment within the muscle out to the superficial compartment is a, is a perforator vein. And these also have valves. So this whole system is, is built with valves. And so the, if you look at the direction of this valve, the superficial veins are on the right, the deep is on the left. The blood can go up in, in, in both superficial and deep systems but it can only go inward from the superficial to deep. It can't come back out to the superficial veins. So that, that valve in the center, in the perforating vein, is oriented in such a way that the blood can only go in. So it's an amazing, uh, complex design, uh, and I'll show you the rest of it now. In your calf, there are calf muscles. The gastrocnemius is the one that we'd recognize the uh, the most readily, which is the calf muscle, the one you see on the surface. Uh, contraction of the, of the gastrocnemius muscle causes, is, is a pump mechanism in your calf. There are sinuses, and if you look down here uh, at the lower part of this picture, this is a sinus. It's a blood-filled sinus, and these are, these are within the gastrocnemius muscle in your leg. So what happens is that you have arterial flow down to your legs, and through the pressure from, through the capillaries and through relaxation of the muscle, these sinuses fill with blood. And it's just an automatic slow filling with blood every, every few seconds. And every step you take contracts that sinus and squeezes it out. So you're not realizing you're just taking a step. But every step you take, you're squeezing the blood out of these sinuses. So let's put this together with the valves. You're squeezing the blood out of the sinuses, and if I go back one slide, the blood moves up, the blood goes across to the deep system and goes up into, the, into your abdomen and back to your heart. So what happens is that you have a system, this is a representation, uh, a diagram showing what's happening with the pump. At rest, these sinuses are filling. And so you get uh, filling of the sinuses here within the muscle. Uh, this is just sort of a passive filling. As you contract the muscles, it forces the blood up and opens the valves. So blood is moving upwards. As soon, if you didn't have the valves, as soon as you relax, the blood's going to come down with the full pressure of a column of blood all the way to your heart. But because of the valves, you, all the valves close. And you get only a little bit of pressure back. So in effect, it's a hydraulic system. If we really think about it, this is how hydraulics work. It's tiny little bits, one at a time. So every step you take, you're squeezing a little bit of blood past a valve. Every little bit of blood that's past the valve sits back on the valve until the next contraction. And you squeeze again and again, every step you take. And walking is how we accomplish that. So walking becomes vitally important in vein health and in treatment. So if you look at, uh, this is a diagram showing venous pressure, and this is, this is measured uh, in the leg uh, and with time, okay? So, and what happens is that these little notch marks are calf raises, okay? So this is basically like taking a step, but every time the person raises themselves up with their, with their uh, calves and goes up onto their toes, uh, the pressure goes down through the mechanism I just showed you. So you're pumping, it's another pump, another pump, another pump. And the pressure goes down because the arteries and the capillaries aren't keeping up with the amount of blood that you're pumping up back to your heart. So you have a decrease in pressure. And then as you rest, the pressure slowly rises back up to normal. You see, and it takes about 20, 30, 40 seconds to get up to normal. So it, it takes a, quite a while to fill. And this is the normal pattern of how the blood flow, the venous blood flow in your legs works. So we call it a, a refilling index, uh, venous filling index, uh, how long it takes to come back up to 90% to, uh, of normal. 
So, what happens to these valves? They can become diseased. And part, there are multiple reasons for it, and we'll talk more about it. But through one reason or another, they become diseased and incompetent. So when we say incompetent valve or reflux, we're talking about a valve that's no longer holding. So it's, it's able to usually pass the blood up towards the heart, but on the way back down, the valves don't close all the way. They don't oppose, and so the blood just rushes back through them. So uh, if you look at this picture, you know, the normal valve is it opens and closes. A leaky valve doesn't close all the way. So you have, you have blood rushing back through. So we call that an incompetent vein or incompetent valve. So if you have incompetent valves, you're going back to that full column of blood. Okay? So you're going back, you, you're, you know, you have a larger, heavier column of blood. It's a higher column, higher pressure. And so if you do the same exercise, the calf raises, and measure the pressure, you get quite a different waveform. The normal one's on top. The one below, the calf raises didn't bring it down as low, and the return to high pressure is faster. See how quickly it made it back up? It only took 10 seconds. So the, because you're not getting the blood up to the heart as effectively, it stagnates there, it stays down, and increases the pressure. And we call that venous hypertension, and we call it specifically ambulatory venous hypertension. And this is what it causes. So venous hypertension leads to varicose veins, swelling of the extremity, skin changes, and it can even lead to ulcer. And this is really an important thing to, to understand because venous disease, for the most part, people see it as a nuisance. But some people who have advanced disease see it as a life-altering illness. And really it should be viewed as a chronic disease with varying levels of severity. The reason for the varicose veins is that you have tiny tributaries off of, the, off of the superficial system, so that one that's close to the skin. There are tiny little collateral veins, the unnamed branches off of the superficial system, but when they're exposed to high venous pressure for prolonged periods of time, they grow and they stretch out more and more and more and they become tortuous and elongated uh, and you end up with these varicose veins. The pressure, this constant venous hypertension in the, in the legs, uh, or venous high blood pressure, can lead to swelling because of just the pressure uh, in the capillaries that it, it's pushing all the, the blood all the way back to the level of the capillaries and the interstitial fluid or the fluid outside the vessels uh, grows. It's high under, under more pressure, there's more hydrostatic pressure to push that fluid out and so you get edema of the leg. The skin changes that happen are because of extravasated red blood cells and the breakdown of hemoglobin within the skin leads to a darkening of the skin at the level, usually at the level of the ankle. And if you'll notice, uh, we call it the gaiter region, you know, as if you're wearing a gaiter uh, around your leg, but uh, the, it's on the medial or the, or the inside of the gaiter region of the leg where this happens, which is right where the great saphenous vein goes to. So there's, if you have incompetence of the great saphenous vein, it can go and lead to that change right there on the, on the inside of the leg. And then ulcers happen when there's not enough oxygen getting to the tissue anymore. So as the tissue, as the pressure goes up, there's a complex process that's not completely understood, but it, it involves high pressure, poor oxygenation to the, to the dermal cells, and an inflammatory response that leads to the breakdown of tissues and, and ulceration. And some people have these ulcerations for years and years and years, and, it, and they leak. They cause huge amounts of fluid to, to come out into the socks or onto the uh, garments, whatever they put on it, the dressings. Uh, and they can be quite a nuisance and very difficult to heal sometimes. So, let's focus on what causes these veins to be damaged. And there are basically two clinical processes that can lead to this damage. The first is obstruction. So I had mentioned deep venous thrombosis. Well, all that is is a clot. It's just a clot forming within the deep venous system. At any point in, the, in those veins that are within the muscle, a clot can form. And, uh, you know, this can happen because of trauma. It can happen because of an infection. It can happen from surgery. It can happen just from laying in bed for a very long period of time. And then reflux, the, the damage to valves can happen because of the thrombosis. Uh, it can also be a genetic component, um, and it can be from the surgical causes or infection as well. 
And sometimes these two are working together to cause the disease. So deep venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolism are a major problem in the United States, and they've, they've attracted a, quite a bit of tension, quite a bit of attention in the medical community. There are approximately 500,000 cases of deep venous thrombosis diagnosed per year, and it's estimated that the mortality uh, related to this type of disease is 50 to 100,000 people per year. And this, you know, the patients get pulmonary embolism, which is a clot that actually breaks free and travels downstream with the flow of venous blood up to the heart and is pumped into the lungs, to the circulation to the lungs, and blocks the oxygenation of blood in the lungs. So the blood is no longer able to get into the lungs to be oxygenated. Phlegmasia, I'll show you a slide on that that shows that's where you have such a blockage of the veins that no blood is able to get to the tissues of your leg anymore, suddenly, it's an acute change. And then post-thrombotic syndrome is a long-term uh, changes within the leg that are very much like the chronic venous pictures that I showed you. So Rudolf Karl Virchow in the 1800s, a German uh, doctor, uh, studied clot formation in the, in the veins and found that there were three uh, contributing factors that seemed to cause the clots to form. Stasis or immobility uh, of blood or of the patient, I mean if they're, if they're laying in bed or if the, you know, if the blood is not moving rapidly. Hypercoagulability from some inciting event or from just an underlying blood problem that causes your blood to clot more easily than the next person. And we have certain tests we run, uh, laboratory tests on the blood that, to look for uh, the propensity to form clots. There's certain well-known disorders that need to be treated or else these clots form. And then damage to the endothelium of the, of the, of the vessel, which is the inside of the vessel, that thin layer that keeps the blood from clotting. So it's a, it's a, it's a kind of an inert layer uh, in regards to clotting uh, so that the blood doesn't feel like it needs to clot. Um, so damage to any of those things, to the endothelium or hypercoagulability or stasis lead to clots. And this is a well-known triad that's taught to every medical student everywhere. So they all know Virchow, Virchow's triad. So pulmonary embolism, as I stated, is when some part of the clot breaks off and goes to the, to the heart. And so the blood flows up through the vena cava and into the right side of the heart. So this is the, the right atrium and it goes to the right ventricle, right, right ventricle pumps. And the right ventricle pumps it out into the pulmonary artery. So we call it a pulmonary embolus because it's going into the pulmonary artery, uh, which supplies the deoxygenated blood to the lungs. So that now, when, if you have blockage of that artery, the deoxygenated blood, it's already supplied the oxygen to the tissues, can no longer get to the lungs to get oxygen. So that can be a life-threatening condition, and people die even in a split second from a pulmonary embolus. It can be fatal immediately. So it's a very big deal. Uh, we give blood thinners, uh, blood thinning medications, anticoagulants, to uh, prevent that from happening in certain cases. This is a condition called phlegmasia cerulea dolens, which literally means painful blue edema. And what happened in this patient is that they formed a clot within the deep system in the iliac or femoral region that it's so, uh, it, it blocked the, the outflow of venous blood from the leg to such a degree that the arterial inflow to the leg was affected because there's only so much space in the leg. So it swells up, and then the artery is pumping blood in, but it's not coming out. And so eventually, the oxygen is, is depleted. The cells can't get the, the oxygen or nutrients they need from the blood, and the leg begins to die. It begins to uh, become uh, necrotic. And so this is a, is a life or a limb-threatening condition. So uh, it requires immediate action, or the leg can be lost. And you can see the severe... Uh, cyanosis, we call it, or the blue color, uh, blue changes of, the, of the, the foot in the lower picture. And so it's, it can be, uh, this is what I was just explaining, the clot forms sometimes just in the femoral vein and can lead to this problem. So thrombectomy was, is the, you know, A option for treating these, and it's the old way that was all we had for a while. For a patient would come in with this, We'd find a clot, and we'd know that the, the veins were blocked, and we'd take them to the operating room. 
open up the vein and take the clot out. Now that's, it, that's sort of the standard of care well before my time, uh, you know, but the, uh, that was what was done, and this is a picture from an old textbook, uh, in this, uh, it's actually from this, a textbook from the 70s where they uh, uh, took the clot out. You pass a balloon catheter up and pull the clot out through the, through the uh, hole in the vein that you've created, the venotomy. So uh, it's still done in certain cases today, but it's not the standard of care currently. And then the, in order to prevent uh, propagation of the thrombus or, or embolization or movement of the thrombus, the clot up to the lungs, uh, they would sometimes ligate the inferior vena cava. So that big vessel, the central vein in the middle of the abdomen, the abdomen would be open you go down to that vein and put a, a tie around it, ligature. And that would stop, if any clot broke off, it, would, it wouldn't have anywhere to go. It couldn't get back up to the lungs. And all the vein, the venous blood then would have to go through collateral channels to get up to the heart. So it, it could cause leg swelling, uh, but it would, it would stop the pulmonary embolus from occurring. So here's that same chart again, but now I've added a third line. So the normal one is A, and you can see how long it takes to get back to the high blood pressure. The middle one, the B, uh, the, that's the venous valve damage, B, okay? So that's where there's reflux within the veins. So it takes longer because you have more venous pressure because those, those segments that are held up by the valves are, are longer now, so your pressure is higher all the time. But C is when you have a complete obstruction. That pressure, when you do your heel raises, it doesn't go down at all because the blood can't get out. So there are people walking around with this problem all the time, and they, they can even develop severe pain with walking, what we call venous claudication, where they have to stop because they're pumping more arterial blood into their legs and it can't get out. It comes back up and hits this obstruction that's in their veins. So uh, they have a serious problem if you have someone with that much pressure. So it's important to identify those people and try to, to fix that problem if you can. So the natural history of DVT, what happens after these clots form in, in the uh, vein? Well, most of them actually will recanalize, so they don't remain obstructed most of the time. They, uh, we often give anticoagulation, which stops new clot from forming. But even the clot that's existing, your blood has chemicals in it, enzymes, that break down these clots. And so, uh, especially with anticoagulation, but even without anticoagulation, many of these veins will sort of reopen little by little. But not all the clot goes away. Uh, some of it will scar down and become these fibrotic tissues within. And so this is a, a you can see an occlusion. Uh, this is an angiogram or a venogram. So basically, this is obtained, for those of you who haven't seen this, uh, uh, through a puncture of the vein from, through the skin and then uh, by injecting contrast agents and taking x-rays. And so the outline of the vein will light up on the x-ray because the contrast is visible under x-ray. And so we'll see these, and this, that's what a venogram is. And so the, the contrast material is injected up. It goes up to the level of the obstruction. And immediately you can see that that's completely obstructed. Later on, you see it going through collateral pathways around the problem, but you can see some of the some of the blood is going through the way it should, in that straight line. And what we find is that the, the vein remodels with this thick, fibrous tissue. And you can see this is a cross-section of an actual piece of vein that has recanalized. It has now has two lumens uh, because the part of the clot was still there. It, it partially opened up, and then it, f it became fibrotic and scarred down. Uh, so this is what you end up with, and it still can transport blood, but the valves are useless. They're scarred up against the wall. They're not, there's nothing in there. It's not functioning. And the vein, its capacity, its ability to, uh, to uh, distend with additional venous blood is gone. All those things that it's supposed to accomplish for the human body are, are basically missing, except for this uh, patency. It still is able to uh, transport blood under pressure. 
And then post-thrombotic syndrome is, is the occurrence of pain, edema, skin changes, varicosities, ulceration uh, at a period of time afterwards. And it's because of this ambulatory venous hypertension. This is the, the key to this whole thing, is that the pressure of the vein, in the veins is, for a prolonged period of time, leads to these problems, okay? So those pictures I showed you, the varicosities, the swelling, the ulceration, and the discoloration, uh, are because of this prolonged venous hypertension. So when it happens after a DVT, we call it a post-thrombotic syndrome. And it usually occurs one to two years after the, after the clot forms, you start noticing that there's really a change in your legs um, after the, this deep venous thrombosis. And even if you've treated it with anticoagulation, even if you've had it treated with some other invasive form of, uh, for removal, uh, you it can still have this syndrome. And so we watch carefully for this. Um, and we, uh, part of the reason we, we recommend early walking after a, after a clot forms is because it decreases the risk of this. More of the clot will, wear, will dissolve uh, by your own body's enzymes and uh, the, its ability to resorb clot. And so it has a, we, we have a decreased uh, incidence of post-thrombotic syndrome. In addition, wearing stockings helps this also, the compression stockings that help augment the action of your calf muscle pump. So it helps push more blood through and it, it, it has, you have less uh, damage to the veins after a DVT. So the current DVT management is more aggressive. This is really a recent change where uh, for years, uh, if you had a clot form in your veins in the hospital or you went to the hospital for that, you would be uh, placed on anticoagulation uh, and when you got to a therapeutic level and your leg was not threatened with limb loss, you could leave the hospital on your anticoagulation and there, no one thought twice about it. We'd follow your, your levels of the, usually it's Coumadin, we'd follow those levels to make sure it was safe and that was all you had done. But now uh, there's much more of an emphasis on protecting these valves, the valve function and uh, preventing uh, post-thrombotic syndrome. Patients are immediately anticoagulated when they reach the hospital as soon as they find out there's a clot. Uh, so, and that anticoagulation is, is continued for a long period of time, a minimum of three to six months. And if we see clots in the more proximal or the veins that are closer to your abdomen, that, that the larger veins, we actually go and get rid of them. And there's several methods that we use. We perform thrombectomies now through punctures uh, most of the time. Occasionally, we still do the open removal of the clot. That's what thrombectomy is, just removal of the clot. But we, we perform these now percutaneous, or through, the, through punctures through the skin and using uh, x-rays and, and angiograms. Some patients have vena cava filter placements, uh, which is a, a metal uh, contraption that's put inside the inferior vena cava. Instead of ligating it, we put a little umbrella in there to, fix, to uh, block the uh, embolus up to the pulmonary arteries. And uh, compression therapy remains a, a mainstay of treatment for these problems. So this is one of the toys that we have. Uh, this is a, a company named Ecos that makes this, this is a thrombolysis catheter. So the human body has a material called uh, uh, plasminogen, and there's a plasminogen activator. And so plasminogen is able to break down clots. It break down, it, it's able to break down the, uh, the clots that are already formed in your body. And so we have this material synthesized and we're able to give this as an injection, but as you can imagine, it's going to break down all the clots everywhere. So it's a very dangerous um, chemical and it's given for strokes uh, when, when people have a clot that goes up to their brain and causes a stroke. If it's in the immediate period, it's given uh, under certain circumstances. But we give it when there's a deep venous thrombosis to get rid of the clot, hopefully preserve the valves, and decrease the incidence of long-term uh, problems like this post-thrombotic syndrome. So this is a special catheter. You can see it down here in the, in the lower right hand that's inserted under x-ray guidance, ultra, uh, we, uh, under angiographic uh, fluoroscopy guidance. We insert this up through the clot. And we sit it in the clot. and it has little holes on the side that leak TPA. 
leak this material that helps you break down the clots. And in addition, this one has an ultrasound transmitter throughout its length that uses sound waves to break the clot as well. So it, it kind of vibrates, it breaks it up. Uh, and then they, so the, the destructive uh, forces of ultrasound, which we use in several other areas of medicine, are used in this case to break down clots. And so the patient will, will generally be brought into the, into the hospital with their, this DVT or this uh, clot. This will be placed within the clot and it will be left overnight or for at least eight hours or so uh, to break up the clot and then the patient will be brought back to the interventional suite, have a repeat venogram performed and see how much is left. And we try to get all the clot out if we can and preserve the vein function. Here's another device called the AngioJet. And this one uh, utilizes a, uh, a uh, saline jet, they call it the Vent Venturi effect, uh, where a high speed jet, high velocity jet of saline is, is formed within the catheter. Because of that, a negative pressure is, is created next to the catheter which sucks in fluid and creates this little tornado of, <laughs> of blood flow right around the catheter. And it, it will break up the, the, the newly formed clots. It doesn't work well on fibrosed elements. It doesn't hurt the, the vessels, but it will break up the, the new clots that form. And then it's, it's suctioned out. And you can use this with TPA also. So you're not only, it's a mechanical destruction of the clot, but it's also a pharmacologic destruction of the clot. And so we, we give the TPA, we have this, this little whirlwind thing whipping up the clot, and then it's sucked out and we can clear the clot that way. So these, these are used in conjunction with the long-term anticoagulation, or Coumadin usually. Here's another one. This one's called Trellis uh, Device, made by Covidian. And there, this one involves two balloons. So this one isolates the segment so it's placed around the, if you have a length of vein, it's placed through the clot, clotted area of vein. And then on either side of the clot, a balloon is inflated. And so those are the two balloons. They, so it isolates that segment. So now the clot is in between those two balloons. And then it has this sinusoidal wire. And what we do is we take this little motor, turn it on, and that sinusoidal wire starts spinning. And it just, it's just like a little uh, egg beater, you know, you, it's, you just grind up the clot. And it has different speeds that you can set. And this one, you also inject the TPA within the clot. So you're grinding it, it's a mechanical, uh, it's a pharmacomechanical thrombectomy is what it's called. So you're removing the clot by not only mechanically grinding it up, but also enzymatically breaking it down using TPA. And so these work extremely well. I've, I've, use them quite a bit and um, uh, they're, they're very successful devices. This is what a, an inferior vena cava filter looks like. Uh, it's packaged in a small tube. So if you can imagine just squeezing this down into a, a cylinder, um, that's how it's packaged. And it, we spring it open inside the vena cava. So we, we put it under, under x-ray guidance, under fluoroscopic guidance, we go into the, into the vena cava and the abdomen uh, through just a puncture in the groin, and we push this out of a tube, and it opens up. And you can see it's like an umbrella without the, um, without the fabric. And so when a clot comes, when a clot forms down, when a clot forms down here in the iliac veins and breaks off, it'll travel up, and the larger ones will get caught. Some small ones might get through, but the larger ones are the ones that are life-threatening. So what this does is it stops fatal pulmonary emboli from occurring. Okay, it doesn't stop all of them, but it stops the ones that'll kill you. And so if you look on x-ray, this is what we see. Uh, you can see on the, on the left side, there's a, the, the filter's in place, and it's also in place on the right. This is the same patient. But on the left side, there's something in the filter. There's a big clot that got stuck there. That white area 
is where the contrast can't fill. So the black part is the contrast that we injected. It goes around that clot. And that white area in the center is clot sitting in the filter. So that filter probably saved that patient's life. Because otherwise it would have gone up. They would have had this uh, terrible suffocating like event and, and died. So, because that's a very, fairly large clot sitting in there. So we also have other interventional devices we use. Uh, angioplasty and stents are, are very popular, uh, or balloon angioplasty and stent placement is very popular treatment options, especially in the coronary vessels. So uh, uh, I'm sure you've heard about it or, or experienced it yourself where the coronary, after, if there's disease within the coronary vessels, um, you have a stent placement. And that's, this is what they basically look like. Um, they're, these are uh, a type of memory metal. It's, uh, called nitinol, that springs to its last form shape. So they make it in a certain shape, they package it down in, into a little tube or catheter, and then when you let it go, it springs open. And they make these out of different materials, but that's the one for, for most of the venous processes that we do, is this nitinol material. Uh, so we treat some of these if, they, if we need to, if there's fibrosis of the veins, or if there's uh, some other mechanical problem that we're trying to fix, we can use these as tools. So uh, the, on the left are the stents, and on the right is a balloon. So you can see that this is uh, showing within an artery how it's used, but it's the same, same idea. So I have a, an example for you, and this is where we do the, the, this type of work is in the interventional suite. Uh, with a, th that's a big x-ray machine, the big C, we call it a C-arm, but um, it's a, this is a... Uh, dedicated interventional suite for, for this type of procedure. So here's a, this is a case study that I've put together that kind of illustrates this concept of what we do in terms of treating the long-term sequelae of DVT uh, as it relates to venous disease. And this is a 75-year-old female with a history of uh, deep venous thrombosis about 15 years ago. And she had some left leg swelling and discomfort, had some varicose veins, uh, and the veins actually extended up onto the abdominal wall. And so when I saw her, I immediately thought, there's, there's another problem here. You know, why is your leg so swollen and why do these veins go up onto the abdominal wall where they wouldn't normally be? That's, that's an evidence of collateralization. So I thought, there's probably an obstruction, and in fact there was. So I did a venogram. This is through a puncture uh, in the femoral vein. And you can see that as the contrast goes in, these are just subsequent images, you can see them filling some interesting structures. So, yes, there's some contrast going up where you think it should go, but there's also all this contrast kind of going down across towards the middle and into the pelvis area, and that's not normal. So those are called collaterals. Those were tiny little veins and they got, because of the obstruction and the high pressure within the veins, they became bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where that's where the blood is going to get back to the heart. So it's going in, it's going across to the other side of the pelvis and going up to the heart some other way. So this is, you know, this is chronic scarring and some recanalization of the iliac system. So I did some intervention with uh, balloon angioplasty within that segment, a couple different balloons, and then I placed a stent within that same area because it had, was still kind of blocked in that area. And the end result, so if you watch these uh, images one by one, you'll see the contrast go in, and now it fills the way it's supposed to. And the interesting thing is you don't see any of those other collaterals filling anymore you've effectively depressurized those collaterals. So now this woman had an excellent result from this, both angiographically, but also in her symptoms. Her leg swelling went down significantly, and the veins all softened. They didn't have, uh, the varicosities were not as high pressure as they were before. So she'll have, you know, we still have some time to watch her, but she'll have, a, I think, a very good result long term from this. So varicose veins, this is, this is something even, this is more common. It's estimated that in America, 72% of women and 42% of men will experience varicose veins by the time they're in their 60s. And the prevalence is very highly uh, correlated to age and gender. 
Uh, women have many more. And it's associated with multiple pregnancies. Uh, a family history is, is highly significant. Obesity, a profession which involves long hours of standing, and a history of obstructive uh, problems in the veins, DVT, like we talked about. So this is, a, this is an interesting flow sheet because it shows kind of how you get to varicose veins and where the vein injury and thrombosis fit in. So uh, varicose veins is over here. There are multiple things that lead to vein injury. So you can have a hypercoagulable state. You can have infection or some other problem that you're hospitalized for. And you can have genetics. And genetics really pays a part, plays a part. And these can all contribute directly to varicose veins, OK? But vein injury usually leads to thrombosis, DVT, or superficial thrombosis, but blockage of the vein. And then even after this thrombosis occurs, you get resolution. This is the post-thrombotic syndrome that I'm talking about. The veins don't, the valves don't work anymore. The, val the veins are not the same. The DVT is done, fine, it's open. But the, val the veins have scarred down in such a way that you still have a problem. Chronic venous insufficiency leading to varicose veins and the changes related to ulcer formation, infl inflammation of the tissues, and swelling of the legs. It's venous hypertension, that's the cause. It's all about getting rid of the venous hypertension and treating these things. So from a historical perspective, veins have been mentioned in medical uh, texts for, for many years. 1559 BC, the Ebers Papyrus uh, mentions varicose veins and surgery was not recommended. Hippocrates in the uh, BC 460 to 377, he said, in the case of an ulcer, it is not expedient to stand, more especially if the ulcer is situated in the leg. The sore is frequently wiped with a sponge and a piece, dry piece of cloth, clean cloth applied. Ulcers which are foul will not heal. So then the, the uh, evil humor theory in the Dark Ages was propagated, uh, and it, it involved much of medical thinking, not just in terms of veins. But the varices were thought to originate by the weight of stagnant blood in the veins. That's not far off track. But it was thought dangerous to heal leg ulcers because those would trap the humors inside. Uh, in uh, the 10th century, Avicenna quotation is, leg ulcers in old people should be left alone, and if healed, should be opened, to drain for humors that if not drained may produce serious illness. 1536, Thomas Vickery, the legs when wounded are very perilous, because unto them runneth a great quantity of humors. So this theory propagated for quite a while, until uh, several hundred years ago, uh, the French and the Spanish, at about the same time, two anatomists uh, began dis describing the, the actual structures in the, in the veins, the valves, and became aware that these could be damaged. And, and that's where it started. The, the people started to figure out the actual physiology of, of veins. William Harvey, finally, in uh, 1628, gave the first uh, description of the true anatomy and function of the, of the venous circulation. So there's, here's some early pictures, um, one from the Fabricius Atlas in 1603, and then the pre preceding that, uh, Salomon Albertus drew this. It was, this is actually, I think, the oldest um, picture of vein valves uh, in existence. But this, the, they started to figure out what was going on here uh, based on the presence of these valves within the veins. And this is William Harvey's uh, drawing his illustration uh, showing the function of veins, where the vein valves were, uh, uh, or pressure was placed on the vein above and below the valve, and you could see that the blood would not drain backwards through the valves. And so he was the first to really describe that that, that was happening, and that these veins were competent structures that held the blood from going the wrong direction. This is another picture of a votive offering from a grateful Greek patient to his doctor that was uh, commemorating, commemorating a sec successful treatment of a varicose vein. You can see the vein running down the leg. <laughs> so uh, 
how do we find these diseases? What do we do about them um, for, for varicose vein disease? Uh, the first is history and physical. We can find quite a bit in just a simple office visit uh, in regards to what's going on and how this happened and what, what the treatment path will be. After that, we perform non-invasive studies, which is considered a level two uh, uh, diagnostic study. These include ultrasound, which is the mainstay of what we do. Plethysmography is measuring the volume in the limb. That's what those tracings are that I showed you with the heel raises, showing volume. It's similar to that. Uh, and then uh, CT scan and MRI are used quite a bit for imaging the uh, venous system. And then level three diagnostic study is like the venogram, like what I did, uh, what I showed you, uh, where you use x-rays and you actually puncture. So it's an invasive study, level three. So, so the history of, of veins, when I see someone in the, in the office, I'll ask them if they have aching, heaviness and tension in their legs, a feeling of swelling. It's often brought on by exercise. So I'll ask, you know, when does the swelling happen? When do you get the aching? Sometimes it's at the end of the day that they'll get this fullness and aching in their legs. Some people have pain at night. They can have restless legs at night. That's a very common thing. They can't keep their legs still, and that can be from venous problems. Uh, and some people get terrible cramps uh, because of this at, at various times. And itching over the varicosities is, is very common as well. Uh, when I ask people their history, uh, I look very closely to see if there was some sort of inciting event. Remember the flow sheet that I showed you, there was infection, trauma, these inciting events, surgery. Those are the things I look for. So some of these patients, I've had patients who had a terrible car accident in their teens. Never thought anything of it, but oh yeah, I had a pelvic fracture. Those can affect the veins that are surrounding. Maybe that vein clotted right then and there and nobody noticed it. These things come up later on. Sometimes it's 20 years later that, they, that we'll find something that contributes to the reason or contributes to the uh, development of their venous disease. And then, of course, I try to, uh, I, the history of, of DVT or PE, obviously, uh, and then I try to find if there's any family history of bleeding or clotting disorders because those are often inherited traits. Uh, it's very important what the person does for a living, how it affects their lifestyle, whether we decide to treat it. We don't just treat veins because they're there. We treat the veins that are causing a problem. They have to be, if they're symptomatic, we do aesthetic treatments for, for veins that are there, but it's generally, it's not an urgent thing. So we can, you know, there's all kinds of other treatments for dermatologic problems uh, that we do in, in terms of vein treatments, but the actual, the patients that uh, really benefit from, the, from this are the ones that are having some sort of uh, problem with their lifestyle. They're not able to accomplish their activities of daily living or uh, whatever they're trying to do or go to their work. So we try to treat those uh, preferential, preferentially. So on a physical exam, I've shown you a few pictures, but uh, there are multiple signs. Uh, at the top here, these are spider veins. So these are very small uh, veins that kind of go in a, in a irregular, uh, tortuous little pattern. These are very common. Reticular veins are a little bit larger, and, uh, uh, but similar, but not, there's not, usually not quite as many of them. Varicose veins, there's edema of the legs. You can have the, the presence of inflammation. This is what we talked about previously, where there's an inflammatory response. It's also related to ischemia and chronic venous hypertension, but it becomes, the skin becomes thicker, more firm. It's an inflammatory <laughs> response in the skin, and eventually this can lead to ulceration. And some of the ulcerations are, are quite pronounced. Some of them go all the way around the lower leg, um, and some of them are very sensitive to different types of treatment, and they can be very painful. Uh, that's, at this point, it's a major problem uh, that we pay quite a bit of attention to. So. Doppler or duplex uh, is something we use quite, a, quite often. Uh, so the Doppler effect, for, for those of you that, that are not familiar with it, uh, if there's something emitting a sound wave that's in movement, so if a car is coming towards you honking their horn or holding on their horn, the sound waves, because the, the, the car is moving, the sound waves are, are emitted closer and closer together. So what you actually hear as a spectator 
will be a higher pitched sound because the sound waves are closer together. And as they pass, it becomes a lower pitched sound because they're actually spaced further apart because the source of those waves is, is moving. So that's the Doppler effect. We use the Doppler effect to track where blood cells are going. We use the Doppler effect to track where objects are in, in the human body. And so we, we, uh, we use this quite extensively for looking at arteries and veins. And I'd like to, uh, I want to show you a, a demonstration. I need a volunteer, somebody who has sleeves. You, can have, are you, you want to come up? Somebody with some veins visible. <laughs> Uh, over here is fine, Kay. but I'll need the, uh, hey Christy, I'll need the, the mic. So, when you need. so let me see your arm. So you can see there's some superficial veins, I don't know if you can see them here, but uh, if I, I have a, a little Doppler ultrasound, so this ultrasound has a little piezoelectric crystal, it's connected to, so when you give electricity to this crystal, it sends uh, sound waves out of the end and it also picks them up as they bounce off of tissue. And so you can follow blood flow. So I'll, I'll try and have this so you can uh, hear the arterial blood flow first. So this is over the radial artery in the wrist. And if I... Uh, That's the blood flow, that's the heart pushing blood through the artery and each beat is picked up because of the Doppler signal of these, of the sound waves bouncing off of those red blood cells or the blood that's moving. So if it wasn't moving, we wouldn't hear anything. It would be still. But because it's moving, we're able to sense this. So then, now I'll show you again, uh, but I'm going to focus a little more on veins. There's a lot more veins than there are, there's a lot more measurable veins than there are arteries. Let's see if I can do this. So if there's all these veins in his hand, and I remember most of the volume, most of the volume of blood is in the veins. So if I take his hand and I squeeze some blood out, you'll hear the veins move if I put it, in the right, if I put it over a vein. So let me see. So it should be, usually it's a little more obvious. Let me see. I don't know if you can hear that. I can hear it. You hear that? I'm squeezing, the blood's moving up. That's the venous blood. It's, it's much more subtle. But when we do this for veins, we don't typically use that device. We use a much more sensitive technique that images the veins along with these sounds. And so we can see, but we do this compression to see if valves are working. This is how we get our diagnostic information. In the legs, when we do it, we put it over a big vein and we'll squeeze the leg and we'll see how much blood rushes back after we squeeze the blood up. So it's just like your calf muscle to see how much comes back down, to see how much reflux is. I need to wipe up this. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you, I, I think she's gonna get you a napkin. <laughs> So uh, we use this extensively, and actually the ultrasound, the probe that is in this picture, is what we commonly use, and we get a uh, picture like the upper left-hand corner. So what's that sh what that's showing is a vein. The red part is the actual blood moving. So it's sensing, the ultrasound will sense the blood moving. A picture is created. This is actually a fairly complex process from, from a physics standpoint in terms of using a duplex machine ultrasound. But the blood is moving along through that vein and then in this case that sudden spike at the end, that, that shape is because the, the vein was squeezed. So that like I squeezed his hand, the leg was squeezed and so the blood rushed up and then it goes back down to its regular flow. And so we use that extensively, the Doppler effect and duplex ultrasound for imaging veins and for the diagnostic uh, tests. MRI is a, and CT scan give cross-sectional slices uh, of, of the human body and they're very useful in, in seeing other structures as well as the veins themselves. And finally, the venography, which I described, 
is really the gold standard in terms of puncturing the vein and, and injecting um, the contrast material. And it allows us to treat the veins at the same time. Intravascular ultrasound uh, is used m more and more. Uh, it's becoming more the gold standard uh, as time goes by. Uh, these are pictures. This is an ultrasound machine, so, but it's 360 degrees. It gives a full circumference of ultrasound around the probe. And so you're able to see the catheter would be, the catheter is in here somewhere, and you see all around it. So it's, it's, the ultrasound is going outward. So this is the, the vein around the catheter. And you can see while it moves, it can go out and in. You can see it varying with, with respiration, with, uh, other, um, with uh, whatever other manipulations you do. So as far as treatment of varicose veins, uh, the vein hook technique uh, was an old procedure described uh, early uh, in the early AD. Uh, showing lig ligatures above and below the, the vein on the leg, and they would disrupt the vein. They would, they would put tourniquets basically above and below, would disrupt the vein uh, in between, and then just put a uh, dressing over it. And it's not terribly different than some of the things we do now, actually, for varicose veins. It doesn't hit the heart of the problem, which is the venous hypertension, but it would destroy that piece of vein, and they would heal in little by little. And so we have phlebectomy techniques that we do, that I'll show you also. Uh, this is in the 1600s, Richard Wiseman came up with a stocking that placed pressure on the veins. And he, was, he found that this would trap the humors, which was an added benefit, uh, but was a more of a palliative uh, treatment because the vein, it would treat ulcers with this, and the vein ulcers would heal. And as soon as you stopped using the stocking, the ulcers would recur. And so, uh, but we, have, we do similar treatment of ulcers now. Um, as one of our mainstays of treatment. So a couple more quotations from a long time ago. When we consider how filthy the habits of many persons are, who often leave their feet unwashed for weeks and months together, it cannot be wondered that skin so neglected should, in the decline of life, possess a very imperfect vitality. Daily washing the lower limbs with a piece of flannel and yellow soap and water is one of the best means of revi reviving their delayed powers. And finally, the limb should be well and evenly bandaged from the toes to the knee, observing that the bandage is to be applied more tightly below and more loosely by degrees as it ascends. So this was a new method in, 19, in 1797 of treating leg ulcers, and it's not really not far off from what we do now. Uh, we even recommend the washing. Uh, so the treatment options for, for uh, this is specifically for leg ulcers. Uh, it's compression, they're pharmacologic. Pharmacologic spans ulcers and varicose veins. Uh, wound and skin care management, I'll show you a couple of things. And then interventional management, which we talked a little bit about already, and I have another one to show you. Paul Gerson Una in the 1800s uh, developed the Una boot, which was a, a, had some zinc protection, but was basically a compression wrap for the leg. 20 to 30 millimeters of compression, and this is still in use. Uh, this is still, uh, if you look at the mainstay of venous ulcer treatment, we use this. Uh, we use the, the compression wraps. Uh, they're changed on a weekly basis, and the patients uh, do achieve healing because the calf muscle pump is augmented. Remember, that's what I said was the key. Calf muscle pump is augmented. The pressure is no longer transmitted to all those little uh, small veins in the, near the skin. Compression therapy comes in a little more sleek forms uh, in the form of stockings that are graded compression. So they start with a higher pressure at the ankle and lower as you go up. They decrease the sizes of the, of the veins within the leg. They increase the, the action of the calf muscle pump. And they have improvement in, in swelling, uh, skin pigmentation, activity and well-being of the patients. And they, these are effective in healing ulcers and preventing rec recurrence, uh, specifically the, the uh, higher compression uh, wraps. As far as drugs for, for vein uh, problems, there are four classes. Uh, we don't know a lot about these drugs other than that they have some effect. 
They're not used in the United States for the most part. They're used widely in, in Europe, the most common probably being the horse chestnut seed extract. And they're shown to reduce inflammation and edema in the legs, but the mechanism is really not understood. Aspirin and pentoxyphylline. Pentoxyphylline is something that helps. It's used in peripheral arterial disease, although its benefit is minimal. Uh, that helps the red blood cells uh, get to the tissue a little bit better. Uh, but those two drugs, which are uh, available in the United States and, and used widely, are not, not really that beneficial for venous disease. This is an interesting um, product called uh, Aplograph. We use this. This is, this is FDA approved for treatment of venous stasis ulcers. It's a two-layer matrix that they, basically what, what they did was formulate a fake skin to help the skin heal. So they tried to put things in this, in this layer of skin that would you buy uh, and uh, things that would help the venous stasis ulcer heal. So it has collagen, cow collagen and then it has human fibroblast and keratinocyte stem cells. And uh, they put it here next, this is the the aplograph is here on the left, and then the regular skin is here on the right. So there's a few more layers to the regular normal skin, but they actually look pretty similar. And you can get healing of these, these ulcers using that product. We also use for, uh, for venous stasis ulcers absorbent dressings because they tend to leak a lot, and antibacterial agents, and you could also do a skin graft on top of them to try and heal. This is an example of an aplograph application uh, showing ulcer healing at 10 months. And so the aplograph was applied to this, and you can see it's sort of healing in little by little and then full healing. So treatment of varicose veins, which is uh, one of the more popular uh, things to have done. The, the idea behind the treatment is to relieve, first relieve any obstructive component. Remember we, t we talked about that how much more pressure there is if you have an obstruction compared to just the valve problem. So that's number one. You have to make sure there's no blockage to the outflow. And then after that, the theory or the uh, strategy is to divert the venous flow to the healthy areas. Okay, so if you have, you know, if the left side of your leg has good valves and the right side has bad valves and you have disease, you just stop the flow on the right side, have it all go through the left, and you'll be fine because the valves work on that side. So you use that pump. So when we find uh, incompetent veins, we look to see where they're competent, and we preserve the ones that are competent, that have good valves, and we take out the ones that are bad. So we have several ways of treating, treating these, and in general, we treat uh, the superficial veins. Remember, the varicose veins are branches from these superficial veins. Remember the tiny branches that have grown over time because of the high blood pressure in the veins to the size that where they can be seen and, and cause symptoms. So uh, the standard of care uh, for the past several decades has been ligation and stripping. And what we do is make an incision at the groin and then make an incision further down the leg. This is for treatment of a great saphenous vein uh, in this instance that is, has broken valves or incompetent valves. And we'll insert this stripping tool down through the vein. Once it's down and comes out of the other incision on the lower leg, you put a, a stripping tool head on the end, which is this deal here. You put it in there and then you withdraw this forcefully. It pulls out the whole vein and all the branches are broken. So you can imagine there's bleeding around in the tunnel. It's a very painful thing to have done. And it's done under general anesthesia because of that. And then the leg is wrapped. Typically, the leg is sore for a while. Uh, it can drain a little bit, but it's f fairly well tolerated because you're asleep when it's done. <laughs> so it's no problem tolerating things under general anesthesia. So this is the tool that we use. It's a, sort of a, a wire, and then there's stripper heads of different sizes that you can place on, and then the uh, the uh, lawnmower starting handle there that you pull. Sclerotherapy is used to treat uh, some of the smaller uh, veins in the legs and also the, lar the and, and, uh, substitution for ligation and, and stripping as well. This is basically injection of some kind of caustic agent into the vein that causes it to 
to clot off and thrombose, okay? So in this picture here, we're injecting into spider veins, and this is done in the office, uh, and it, you'll see them as you inject it, it blanches as the, as the vein is uh, blocked with this agent. It just causes it to, to clot. And so you'll see that it, the whole area will turn, will blanch, you will get immediate, uh, immediate uh, disappearance of these veins. And then uh, the reticular veins, a little bit larger veins, those are up to three millimeters, and those can be done the same way with very good results. And uh, this is uh, widely used for, for, for treatment of those uh, skin problems. It's also uh, useful for treatment of the larger truncal veins or the saphenous vein, um, and s great saphenous and small saphenous vein uh, with very good results. It will block off those veins and then divert the blood flow to the other healthy ones, which are usually the deep veins. So we, we also use external lasers. There's certain frequency lasers that can be used that will cause these small veins in the skin to, uh, to, uh, to clot and uh, disappear. This is a procedure called phlebectomy. So we do this also in the office or in the operating room. Uh, but it's basically a tiny uh, incision made, one to two millimeters in size in the skin. Uh, with anesthesia, there's, there's local anesthetic placed around the, this wound and the vein is pulled out. And so this drawing at the bottom shows the vein being pulled out. Of course, it's big, but it's typically done through a very small incision that you can barely see. And so this is done as an office-based procedure uh, also. And then endovenous ablation uh, is the latest thing for treating the, the veins instead of ligation and stripping. So this is a huge breakthrough in, in treatment of, of superficial venous reflux disease. Uh, the catheter, which is shown here on, on the left side, is advanced through a puncture in the lower leg into the vein, and it's passed all the way up to the groin within the great saphenous vein or the small saphenous vein or whatever vein is responsible for the reflux problem. And then it, it, this one's an, a radio frequency ablation catheter, but there's also a uh, laser uh, catheter that can be used. And it, it transmits energy to the vein wall as you slowly withdraw it out of the, out of the vein. And so the whole length of vein it has this energy applied to it or burned, uh, and it clots off and scars down. It basically closes up and scars down into just a fibrotic thin cord. Uh, and so they no longer have the reflux through the superficial system. The healthy valves in the deep system are then used and, and typically the symptoms of uh, varicosities, if it's due to this, are uh, immediately resolved. The patients leave the hospital and, or leave the office and say, oh, my leg already feels better. <laughs> so uh, it's very well tolerated um, and uh, uh, commonly in use. And it's done in the office. Uh, with the patient awake. This one, it looks like the patient's sleeping, but uh, typically I'll have the patient sitting up and talking to me while we do the procedure, and they usually don't want to watch, but there's not much to see either. So um, I have a little video for you. So this is the, the system. It's into the vein all the way up to right before where it joins into the deep system. The energy is applied to the vein wall in seg segmental fashion. So it's done once there and then you move it back a little bit and apply the heat again. And this is a painless procedure. And instead of pulling the whole vein out with the ligation and stripping to that big lawnmower tool, you're performing this in the office Patient, as a patient, you come in, you can come in during your lunch break, you can come in in the, you know, in the uh, late afternoon and leave, and you drive, drive home, go about your regular errands. There, it doesn't slow you down at all, this procedure. So it's really a major breakthrough in treatment of this because it accomplishes exactly the same thing as pulling the whole vein out and ligating it off and doing, doing the whole surgery. We do the whole procedure with ultrasound guidance, and that's what that picture was showing, um, so that we see exactly where we are. So that, that's a major, major breakthrough in venous care. So 
what we'll do is with the treatment, this is a, a lady with the varicose veins, and it happens to be the same picture as I showed you before, because it wasn't really that one, it's this one. But you can have pretty dramatic results with treatment of the superficial reflux disease. That's an after picture. Um, <laughs> you don't believe me? <laughs> that's my best result. That's the one. <laughs> no, this is, but you actually do get quite a bit of benefit um, from treatment of these. And, and uh, this is within a short period of time that you can have this with a combination of, of the treatment of the, the you're depressurizing all those varicosities with the endovenous ablation. And then sometimes there are a few varicosities that are still visible or symptomatic that need to be removed through those tiny little uh, incisions. And that's an easy, easy thing to accomplish, and we do that in the office as well. So very good results from that. And there's another picture showing a treatment that, uh, uh, that resulted in, in a pretty nice result for the patient. So I want to move on. I want to touch very uh, quickly on one other area, which is... Um, a very specialized area of, of vein care, which is reconstruction of the venous valve. So um, this is something only done at specialized centers, um, but it's uh, when you've treated all the, the superficial system to the best degree, you've given compression, you're, you're treating all the patients uh, with all those, the things I mentioned, all the different uh, modalities, sometimes they just need a good working valve and you don't have one um, in the legs, and so you have this constant reflux. And when the patient is, you know, at a stage where they have either such a disabling problem or a limb threat problem because of this, these problems, they need a new valve and, or, or something done. So we have several different things, and I'll just touch on them briefly because it's, it's well beyond the, um, this talk to, to describe them in detail. But, uh, there's, this one is called internal valvuloplasty, and this is showing a deep vein. And what they do is you open up the vein uh, the long way and view the valve. And this is what it looks like from the inside, is these two little cusps. Um, and they're usually elongated and they're not in good shape. And so you take a little suture and tighten them up inside and then put, and then you sew up the outside of the artery, or the vein. And, uh, this was first done by Dr. Kistner in 1968 and still is, is performed in the same fashion. You can do it on the outside of the vein just by seeing where the cusps attach. Remember I told you the vein walls are very thin, so you can actually see the valves through the vein wall. So you can just put a suture on the outside of the vein at the appropriate spot on the valve and tighten up the, the connection. So it's called external valvuloplasty. Another option is to band it. If, you, if, you, if your valves, if your vein has become aneurysmal or dilated and that's the reason for the valve dysfunction, sometimes just by bringing the uh, walls of the vein together you can have an improvement in valve function. And so a piece of uh, polyester wrapped around the vein and sutured there in place can sometimes solve the, uh, the issue and give you a competent vein that can, in, that can improve the pump function and the, the flow of blood to the, back to the heart. Valve transplantation is performed usually from an axillary uh, vein, so up in the, in the arm, a piece of the deep vein there that has a competent valve will be taken and placed or interposed into the uh, lower extremity vein. And so you can put it in the leg vein and sew it in place. Uh, what it's showing here is the the valve is this area. This is what's taken from above. And it's sutured in here and then sutured in here. And then they put a sleeve around it and so that, it, it, uh, that that valve can then be used in the lower extremity. And they put the band around it because the arm veins are even weaker than the leg veins. So they're, they're more prone to uh, uh, dilation uh, over the long term. So they put a sleeve around it. And then vein segment transfer, uh, if you have one set of veins that, that uh, has a competent valve, like if your great saphenous valves are working, you can actually move your deep system over to that and try and utilize those valves just by moving it over and sewing it on. So this one, normally this would connect here, but these valves don't work. So you move it over here so that you have this valve protecting this system. 
And then finally, these are in uh, development still. This is not a common uh, item, but the valves are being developed that can be implanted endovascularly, so through punctures and placed inside the vessel. And these are still, they're still working on these in animal models and uh, at some experimental level. But eventually, uh, I expect that these will be commonplace, where we'll be able to implant these valves within the deep veins of the legs and save, these, save patients from having these long-term complications of venous disease. This is an active area of research uh, that I'm very interested in. And that's all.